Now, the best days of your life, that's the cliche, but there seems to be growing evidence that large numbers of young people are suffering from mental health problems. Tomorrow, a new charity, Mindful, launches an online counselling support service for young people. The launch coincides with a survey that suggests one child in five has symptoms of depression and almost a third have thought about or attempted suicide before they were 16. Well, in a moment, we'll hear from the clinical psychologist, Tanya Byron. But first, three young people tell us about what it's like to suffer with mental health problems. From a very young age, I was always worrying, scared about things that you shouldn't really be scared about. When I was aged 11, I had what is known in the health service as a mental health crisis. Um, I missed months of school, I couldn't leave the house, I was having five to six panic attacks a day and things became really, really awful. It's a numbness in your hands and feet, shaking, not being able to breathe, not being able to think about anything apart from what you're worrying about. You can wake up one morning and feel fine and then later in that day have a panic attack and you have no idea why. Your heart feels like it's going to burst out of your chest. It's, it's actually physically painful. I would say on average I have one to two a day, but when I'm having a really intense period of anxiety it can be as much as five and six, which is just, it's exhausting. So I didn't want to put pressure on my parents and I thought, no, I'll just keep it to myself. I've dealt with it my whole life, I can deal with it for, for a bit more. When I was 14 I thought I might actually commit suicide and there's a difference between considering the idea and then actually thinking like how you'd plan and how you'd go about committing suicide. You can't tell whether something's just hormones, whether it actually is a mental illness. And I had that confusion in my mind. I was like, is this normal? But then it gets to the point where you're looking at sharp objects and thinking about the ways that you could kill yourself with it. And I think that that's when you realise that it's not hormones. That's actually something much more serious because I don't think that's something that most teenagers would do. For me, things started to change when I was around 14, 15, when the sort of pressures of exams and GCSEs came. I wouldn't see my friends, I'd, I wouldn't be as sort of open, I wouldn't want to speak to anyone. I'd be up in, I'd, be, I'd come back from school and I'd just sit up in my room for hours upon end. Every day I'd wake up and my headaches would be there. It'd feel like a vice was gripping my head. It came to a point where I didn't want to get out of bed because they were so sort of painful. And once the headache started, I sort of found myself having nosebleeds probably two, three times a week. And then my hands started shaking. I thought I was going to die just mainly because I was looking at my symptoms on Google. And I sort of convinced myself that I had medical sort of problems. I thought I had a brain tumour. I didn't tell anyone for weeks upon weeks upon weeks. And then eventually um, it sort of just all got a little bit too much. I came home from school early because I couldn't face sort of the afternoon lessons. I just, I just sat in my room and just sort of burst out crying. My parents were going through a lot of things at the time. My mum's health wasn't great. Because I saw them struggling, I didn't want to have to go and whack another 10% on top of what they had. A lot of the way through primary school I was bullied. Um, coming to secondary school as well I was, I was bullied and that sort of took a big effect on sort of the way I behaved, the way I interacted with people um, and just generally how I felt about myself. I, I sort of let it build up to the extent that I was having headaches, nosebleeds, um, panic attacks. I wouldn't want to sort of go outside. I just want to come home from school, um, sit in my house, do what I do and then on the weekends I wouldn't even want to go shopping with my family. I think it's a massive problem. You know, we're not told that it's okay to talk about mental health. And I think that's the hardest part, is when you're going through something like that, it's not going through what you're going through, it's finding a way to stop it and finding a way to talk about it. It's a big, big positive step that now the youngsters of this generation are actually understanding that it's okay to talk out about their problems. So it's about intervention when you're younger and sort of stopping your problems before they can develop into something sort of greater when you're older. 
most days I just stay in bed and listen to music. I don't go out, I don't really socialise, I don't do any work. I just I either read or I listen to music because the effect it has on your ability to work, to concentrate, to focus, to persevere is enormous. I get really infuriated when people say, oh, just get yourself together because I don't think they realise quite how serious it is and quite how difficult it is to pick yourself up from that. You can't do it by yourself. You need help. And if you want more information or help, go to the website www.mindfulwith2ls.org. And with me now is the Child and Adolescent Clinical Psychologist, Professor Tanya Bryan. Uh, Tanya Bryan, first of all, the... We, we've heard from uh, teenagers there, but the, what your survey suggests, the Mindful Surgery says, we're failing to pick up on a lot of, of mental health issues amongst teenagers. Yes, and I, th I just want to start by saying this is about prevention. So this isn't about increasing numbers. This isn't about medicalizing children, okay? This is about getting in early so that we can offer support to children before they develop problems that become chronic. I work in child and adolescent mental health services. I and my colleagues know that we get children who have a level of chronicity that is enormous because waiting lists are so long. And also we know that cuts in services up to 40% in some local authorities to child and adolescent mental health services means that, as LSE showed us in a 2012 survey, three quarters of children who need support for mental health problems are just not getting it. Um, the, uh, one of the other arguments would be, though, that adolescence is tough. It is. And that a lot of, there's a lot of external forces uh, going on. Indeed. You know, there's the social context, there's what's happening in the school. Mm -hmm. That actually, they have a huge impact on how a child feels. And of course, we've just heard that there with bullying, that it's not always that the child has a mental health issue, is it? It's that, that the circumstances are such, which lead to real anxieties and real problems. Exactly. And I mean, I couldn't have put it better myself. And this is why Mindful is such a brilliant charity. I'm proud to be the president. We want to take take peer mentoring into schools to enable young people, children and young people, we train them to then offer support and advice to other children and young people who are struggling with sometimes, as you say, the everyday difficult realities of growing up, of the transition into adolescence. By getting in early, by preventing that, we're preventing chronicity in the population, but also longer term adult mental health Is problems. Is there an issue though that you perhaps um, label teenagers with particular issues and particular problems which almost are a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't mean that generally, I mean from you know in individual cases. That's precisely what we're trying to not happen. We don't want these children to become so chronic that they do become labelled, they will get a diagnosis. So if you have a peer mental support system, young people who talk to each other, who can then offer resources and online counselling, we can stop situations developing into full bone mental health problems. You, th this, this will require, when you say peer mentoring, this will require you know, huge resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you say that the, you know, the, the waiting lists are dreadful within school. Huge resources in order to give every child that needs it sufficient, consistent, reliable help. Mm -hmm. um, because the danger is that you, you can't do everything. And that actually that sometimes in itself could cause more damage. Yes, but we're not doing hardly enough. And what we're looking at is how we can, we can enable young people who are using social media, yeah. who say in, very clearly in tons and tons of research that peer mentoring and social media support is what young people value. Face-to-face -face consultation is very threatening. Mm. Online therapy is a good place to start for young people. But online therapy, again, still has to be consistent, reliable. And actually, the danger is surely with some online th therapy that what you're doing is you're making a diagnosis. Although you say you want to prevent that, you end up making a diagnosis online. So we're supported by Cabinet Office and a number of third sector agencies so we have a huge amount of resourcing. Our therapists are BACP accredited, they're trained therapists and counsellors. We do everything not to diagnose children but to enable them to emp and empower them to manage their own mental health safely. Tell you Ryan, thank you very thank much. You, thank you Kirsty.